So, you know, we, we heard, uh, you know, a lot of things uh, related to different aspects of materials data. We, we you know, your, your data set or your, your database or your repository could contain computational data sets, experimental data sets, spectroscopy data, or like, you know, machine learning models, et cetera. Now, uh, you know, what, uh, what I would ask you is, uh, how do you convince like a researcher, you know, whether a new researcher or an experienced researcher, how do you convince them that publishing their data will contribute to their academic success? Okay, so I, I know some people mentioned incentivizing, but, uh, you know, I, I would just like to hear if, you know, you have thoughts on this. So, you know, anybody who wants to get started uh, here. I can oh, you go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I can get started on this one. So for MDF and Foundry ML, um, when you publish um, on either platform, you get a DOI so people can cite you. Um, and we also collect the stats on how often your uh, data is used. Um, and we also started sharing many of the latest data sets on social media, which increases visibility. So the more eyes on your data, um, the farther it goes. Yeah, I'll just largely echo that as well. So putting my materials project hat on, right? We have uh, an MP contrips interface where users can contribute data. And I think the nice incentive is the, kind of the incentive here is that the materials project is one of many databases that has high visibility and probably larger visibility than if you're not part of one of those database tech communities. And so by being able to interface with that ecosystem, uh, it's again, hopefully incentivizing other people to then build on your work and to put incentives on it, cite your work, right? And these all end up going back to hopefully making it more likely for people to actually go and, and contribute to that, that environment that we've set up. Okay, other other thoughts? Well, um, yeah, I just want to, uh, I, okay. Maxim, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to Maxim. point out that I think the critical questions is whether the current incentives in academia and science in general are aligned with the incentives that we are discussing uh, here, right? Uh, because as I mentioned, you know, it, like, will it help your, how much it will help your career if you, you know, really invest this time and effort into uh, sharing uh, data and code? And to, to be honest, I mean, I, I'm very big, uh, uh, you know, supporter of open data and open code, but even I cannot really answer that question, to be honest, within the current uh, system. So, um, yeah. So uh, I, don't, I don't want to sound very pessimistic, but uh, it's it's not entirely clear because you spend you know like uh, twice more time on uh, you know uh, invest uh, on you know, data and code sharing, and then someone just you know publishes without any of it in a journal better <laughs> than what you published because now the reviewers, no editors appreciated it. And so, so like then you, as, after some time, after a few years, you will start asking yourself, so why am I even doing it, <laughs> right? I need to publish more. I need to have not 10 papers with shared, also, like not five papers where I shared code and data, but instead I better publish 10 papers where I don't share anything, but it looks much better on my uh, CV resume and so on. So that, that's, that, that's a kind of serious uh, challenge that uh, we are facing right now. Yeah, certainly. Very interesting. And yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, Kamal, uh, you, you you were going to say something. Yeah, so I was going to say incentives. In terms of incentives, we talked about the visibility, like, you know, integrating with a well-established infrastructure. Uh, we talked about citations. Another incentive, which is a bit personal to me, is like, uh, when I go back to my work, like five years ago, what I did, if I want to find it out in a nice way, it helps me a lot. If there is a GitHub repo, if there's a notebook, I don't know. I feel it's very important for me as well. And, and when I transfer my project to another postdocs, you know, so that's also an incentive. And as somebody mentioned, like visibility, right? So I have, I've been working with some of the universities and they want to integrate their own project in Jarvis. And uh, the one of the incentive is when they write proposal to NSF, again, I'm not advertising, but when they write to NSF, they said, hey, I'm integrating with Jarvis. And I have seen that they get some visibility out there. So these are some of the incentives, right? And and in terms of DOI and stuff, MDF, fixed chair, all these things provide you DOI, right? Uh, and this, uh, people can cite it. And one of the things I personally present in my meeting is like, I, I say to my managers, hey, see how many times my data is downloaded and cited and so on. And that keeps us getting funded in an indirect way, right? So it's not directly correlated. So these are some things I think, uh, which are incentives in this field. Yep, certainly, fantastic. Yeah, uh, Christoph. Yeah, I'd like to remind all of us how much um, 
data most of us give to services like Google or so. Um, and two, there's two reasons for this. First of all, we get something back immediately. And second, it's easy. So I think it's really important to provide services in these online databases that what I've tried to say um, are something that people don't have by themselves or state-of-the-art techniques that can process data online. And second, make it as automated as possible. So actually, you know, this normal database that you've seen, um, one of the success or one of the reasons for the success is that there was a number of people that invested hundreds of man hours or person hours to or months, person months, um, to code um, converters between different outputs of DFT codes. So they can ingest data of 40 different DFT codes, but you have to somehow convert these to a common data format that you can then really compare apples with apples. And that is something, so you have to make it easy and you have to provide something that people want to use. Yeah, that kind of brings up the challenges we are facing right now too, and you know how to make it more universal and uh, you know and more accessible, right? I mean, there is a big roadblock to people putting in the effort, like you know, oh, my format doesn't match with what you know, uh, Nomad wants or MDF wants. You know, it's a, it's a potential issue. I mean, I know we are we are working towards that, right? So so we'll we'll get to that maybe you know uh, in, in in a little bit. Uh, ben, would you like to you know ask us uh, another question? We have a number oh. of questions in the doc. So. I would just make a point that I think we've we've heard a common theme of needing to reward data sharing more uh, more equitably. And so, you know, those of us who are on tenure committees and things like that, I think we should be uh, looking at those as important items because uh, that's really where some of the change will happen. So the next question, I'm going to stick with incentives because we're on that topic, it was from Richard Sheridan. He asks, uh, about the idea of a data leaderboard as a way to incentivize interaction and contribution to databases. Have you seen that being successful and what other new incentives are being tried? And I'll start with Kamal because I think that was mainly to him. All right, so I'm just looking at the question. Um, Okay, so so the leaderboard thing, right? So has that been successful? Um, so I have seen a bunch of leaderboard, at least in the material science community, like uh, Matt Bench, uh, Open Catalyst Project. There is one from a QM, a QM9 data set. And I have seen that most of the machine learning papers, if you do not use a standard benchmark, uh, the, the most likely the reviewers will frown upon that. So it is important but it, it has not been globalized yet. And one of the reasons, and it has been mainly done for economic structures community, not for like microscopy and text data and so on. So the reason we started this Jarvis leaderboard, and I'm just pasting the link in the Google chat, and uh, it's still a work in progress, uh, is that we people can easily integrate the, uh, the bench, uh, their benchmark data set, as well as benchmark performance models in this leaderboard. And without too much of coding, I mean, some of the, for example, experimental people, they do not want to have a lot of Python coding and all this thing. So what you do is uh, literally create a CSV file and just upload there and it will generate the uh, metrics and everything for you. So, uh, so yeah, so I think this is the thing uh, which is gonna make the data computer and material science successful. That's my opinion, because if you see computer vision, right? ImageNet after 2016 or 17, 2017, the, everything's just, you know, uh, took the heat. Why? Because there was a well-standard problem. This is the problem we want to solve. In the material science, this is not defined yet. And once we decide this goal, what we want to do, like in a leaderboard fashion, then I think it will be really useful and it, people will start looking into this. So that's one of the idea of this Jarvis leaderboard. And again, uh, still a work in progress, but yeah, um, ho hopefully that answers your question. What other, yeah, um, new incentives, uh, right? So. Yeah, I talked to you about the uh, already three, four things. So first, it's a citation, of course, the how many times you download it, uh, you are on the leaderboard or not, or where you are on the leaderboard or not, uh, you know. Uh, and when you write a paper, sometimes it can be part of an abstract, like I'm gonna, like this is a state of the art of the uh, performance, so on, you know. So these are really some of the good incentives. And if these are not uh, encouraging incent incentives, then I don't know what would it be. This is pretty handful, I think, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, hopefully that answers. 
Yeah, yeah, that's great. So I don't know if anybody else has ideas around. Uh, um, I, 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 I would just I would just add that we really need to work more on the experimental uh, science databases. We don't; uh, they're nearly non-existent for many domains. So, um, all I would point out that as someone who had experimental background, have a, has experimental background myself, that there are a lot of experimental scientists who actually love coding and are, are pretty good at coding. It's <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, so that's that, that's one. Of the, but uh, one one uh, point I wanted to bring up is that there is also a danger with those leadership uh, boards and so on because you know we, we might end up chasing those sort of scores and it will actually will slow down our science, right? And I think this is what happens in uh, machine learning community in a way right now, right? Uh, you you know spend so much time to go from eighty five percent accuracy to eighty seven percent accuracy, but it's not clear how it is applicable to real world applications, right? So and in science especially, you know those uh, data sets is something that we already know, but the purpose of doing science is to discover something unknown, right? So it's again this interpolation versus extrapolation, and I mean they have value certainly, but I know there is a danger of you know started chasing them. Uh, uh, at the expense of you know uh, chasing those uh, sort of scores, at the expense of uh, doing new science, so something you need to be uh, aware about. I think. Has awesome, anyone yeah. else experimented yeah. with uh, with leaderboards? I think maybe Materials Project has one. I, I'm not sure if uh, if Fairmat has one or not, but has that been something you have tried as well? Talking about me. Um, yeah, either either of you, uh, materials project or yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't think we haven't. Uh, we have no, we haven't. Yeah, so we have at the materials project, and I will just briefly add to the excellent conversation here that one of the benefits of the benchmarks, kind of as a flip side, is that I think it makes it a lot easier for people who are machine learning or CS experts first, and not material science domain experts first, to break into the field because this is something that they're much more familiar with, and you're trying to really make a very clear stance about what the main output is. And again, there's questions about if that output is worth optimizing, but at the end of the day, this gives the machine learning researchers themselves um, easier way to break into this space, which I think is certainly important as well. And I would just add, we, so we don't have a leaderboard for Foundry or MDF, um, but for Foundry ML, it's something that we've talked about, you know, it's on our roadmap for the future of having a leaderboard and benchmarks and something we're excited about. Um, but that's part of that is because, um, you know, adding any sort of like gamified, gamifying features um, always seems to really incentivize people or make something that's make something seem more fun or turn something into a competition that usually isn't so um there seems to be a lot of uh, backing that these are successful incentive incentives, but um, so that's just like a general comment since we haven't uh, implemented that yet for our, our software tools. Yeah, I would I would just quickly add that these uh, you know leaderboards are absolutely an, an excellent idea, although you know we, we should not be chasing them, but you know when we did a machine learning workshop for MRS in the fall, we had a, a challenge at the end and you know that attracted a lot more people because they want to see them on, on the leaderboard. And it also helps in our classes actually, you know when you're teaching in class and you know uh, a healthy competition among students, you know maybe may, may be good. So uh, if we are ready to move on from this question, I can ask uh, another one, uh, Ben, if, if that is okay. So uh, I, I might focus a couple of questions on the computational side since you know, I'm coming from the DFT uh, side as well. So there are some specific questions. So, you know, let me ask a question to, to, to Andrew, who might have seen this already. Have you negotiated various uh, MOF naming conventions across different repositories, such as CSD and Tobacco? And is your MOF data available for reuse and training? So, you know, uh, if you can answer that. Yeah, I'll just briefly answer that. So for the data reuse and training, yeah, absolutely. All the data is available. You can certainly do what you like with it. Uh, train new models, use it as a starting point for new calculations, certainly by all means, and all of the data itself, uh, to kind of touch on a prior comment, it, the, all the source files are made available through Nomad as well. So I think that's a really great initiative to kind of bring multiple projects together. For the naming conventions, I think that's a problem in many different fields, but certainly in the metal organic framework space, there's not a consistent naming scheme. And so that makes it really difficult to kind of compare properties between databases as one of many examples. And so there have been folks in the community, including uh, Randy Snurr's group where I did my PhD, 
uh, we have a paper on a, a scheme called MOF ID, which tries to help address this problem by providing a unique identifier uh, based on a SMILES representation of the organics and other uh, kind of components based on the topology to give it a unique representation. However, um, there's certainly other folks who might want to come up with alternate schemes. And I think maybe as a community at large, we need to work a little bit better at having some sort of dedicated naming scheme. And I think at the end of the day, really have some way of buying into this. So, you know, there's a convention, either implicit or maybe explicit by a given journal to, you know, report a given material a certain way. I think that will go, you know, be very beneficial. Okay, uh, thank you. So the, I have a quick related question, which I believe would be suitable for Andrew and Kamal, maybe KJ as well. The others are, are welcome to uh, pitch, uh, chip in as well. But related to the, the computational, you know, data problem and, you know, the limitations that Andrew touched on as well. So how do you guys reconcile, like, you know, the, the, the various limitations, levels of theory, or like, you know, uh, you have band gap models, which work for, you know, maybe organic and organic materials, but you know, they work for MOFs, but they do not translate to other types of materials. You have one level of theory, which works for, you know, one type of materials. So the applicability may not be as large, even within the same chemical space, you may not have expanded it enough or, you know, disorder and defects you may not be considering, et cetera. So when you guys build, you know, NIST, the NIST uh, Jarvis data set, the materials project data set, and, you know, I generate a lot of DFT data myself as well. So how do you, you know, what is your suggestion on, is all the DFT data useful regardless of how inaccurate it is? How does it actually connect with, you know, eventual discovery? Uh, how do experimentalists make the best use of it? Any thoughts related to that? And, you know, this question is open to everyone, but maybe Andrew and Kamal can, can get it started. You want to go ahead? <laughs> okay. okay, I can start. So, yeah, I think um, I want to start with an example. So uh, when we started with the GGA level band gap, for example, right? So we thought it's always underestimated. Maybe it's not very useful. But then we found that if you use a certain correction term, you can get very, very uh, good agreement with uh, the experimental data. So it was possible only because we have the data in a nice format way and we could fit to the experimental data, get a model and stuff like that, right? If this data was not available, there was no opportunity for actually fitting a model. So is this data useful even if it's not a uh, gold standard? Yes, I think it is. Okay. Yeah, you pretty pretty much said exactly what I was going to say, with the caveat too that I was trying to bring up a little bit earlier. That um, you know that's really a great approach of how machine learning might help bridge that gap between low accuracy and high accuracy data, as one example. But we also need to make sure that those who aren't as computationally inclined can recognize and understand that when the data is not necessarily in the highest fidelity state, what they can actually learn from it and how the, how we can prime them so that they know exactly what they're interpreting because there's a lot of times, for instance, where users of various databases might say the band gaps, you know, very underpredicted, the whole data set's garbage. When we know that's not really what it is. So trying to address both of those is I think an important challenge. I can tell you from personal experience that a lot of people do regard the data set as as, as garbage sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Even if you pitch it exactly the way that that you did. So, you mm -hmm. know, I think that's another part of the challenge too, you know, yeah. for the community. Uh, any any other thoughts related to that from from the others? Okay, yeah, yeah, we can move on to another question, uh, Ben, if you would like. To. Sure. Yeah, I'm going to ask a question from Kate Brinson. Uh, she says the issue of getting potential users to try and learn new workflows is daunting. There are so many excellent options, like we saw today. We saw four or five different options, options within those options. Um, she says I think people can be paralyzed by those. How can how do we end up getting to a coherent infrastructure and message together? I think we need to get together more often, uh, have some sort of hackathons maybe, and then it will just naturally, uh, could, it could naturally emerge, you know, uh, that's, I, that, that, that's, I mean, I, I think there are a lot of like, yeah, th there are many separate efforts and we don't even know, not, not, all of us talk very frequently to each other, right? And especially when it, um, like I see there are, the efforts in theory and experiment are largely separated and pretty much isolated from each other, right? So organizing um, some, uh, not not like conference style event, but more informal, uh, you know, hackathons, I think uh, could potentially be very helpful. And, you know, 
the the hope is uh, that you know that something will naturally emerge out of uh, those activities, something more centralized. Uh, yeah, Christoph. Um, yeah, so I, I think that it, it becomes more yeah, important to actually share data and have also available a large set of data, then more of these databases will actually invest into also pooling data from other databases so that all these different databases actually can reference each other and then they have them on a common uh, level, I hope. Um, I think this will probably develop naturally. Um, so this is very much related to the challenge uh, that I had on my my last slide of, you know, we've built these really cool tools, but, you know, how are we, how do we get the word out? How do we get people using them? Um, so that is a question I still have. And I think, uh, yeah, part of that is compatibility of, okay, I've hosted my data here. I don't want to upload my data to all of these different things. If I upload it, it's hosted once, can't I, you know, be listed on these other uh, platforms? And I think that's something that we are trying to um, address with Foundry ML. MDF is not the only place that you can host data and have it be featured on Foundry. It's, you know, the way we have it, uh, you know, connected since we are the ones that, you know, are building both <laughs> right now, but it is possible to, to do that. So people don't have to just keep uploading um, data to all these different platforms. Um, but yeah, I think it's getting the word out about this, these really cool tools is really difficult in grad school. I remember I wanted to find, you know, like data sets that I could use for machine learning and accessing large data sets, um, that actually I could make sense of, you know, when, uh, when I downloaded them was really hard and I wish I, you know, I'd found out about these tools. So I'm interested in, in more responses too of, of, yeah, how do we get people actually using these solutions that we make? Yeah, I think on the topic of getting widespread adoption of certain tools, I think one thing that's beneficial is really having, making sure that the users see some sense of potential longevity for that initiative, right? So there's a lot of things, especially in academia, where there's a small pet project and then it dies out without support. Um, and I think when we think about workflow tools, that's something that might you might use at the backbone of your research group or, you know, for a project for many years to come. And so things, I think that's a reason why things like, for instance, Zenodo is one, you know, not a material database, but general repository that's taken off because you know that there's a whole lot of backing behind it. Why things like, you know, you see Jarvis being around for such a long time and it's like, okay, great. I know it's probably going to stick around for longer. So I think these are things that help, you know, make certain workflow tools more concrete. If you see this larger backing and have some sort of vision for the longer term. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask a question uh, that I see from uh, Kenneth Cronline, uh, although Kenneth says that it's less relevant following Christoph's talk, but I, I think it's still worth discussing. I think Christoph, Maxim, and you know the others can definitely talk about this. Uh, can you speak to you know how your specific sources that you guys talked about, how are they helping in empowering the interoperability and reusability of data? And what are the pain points in making this work in in your in your you know uh, specific research, so you know your the community might work on relevant tooling. So yeah, the, you, you can see the question uh, online as well. Uh, anybody who wants to get started, maybe Christoph. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, one of the pain points definitely is that um, even within the same technique, if it's experimental, you have many different formats and actually often proprietary formats. And uh, this is really a pain point. And that is where um, I think things are going to somehow, uh, well, yeah, heal themselves, it seems, because once there is an open format available, then companies will actually start to, to um, provide converters into these formats and will start to uh, support this because all governments, at least in most countries that I've seen, now require that data is shared. And so, Customers that buy these instruments, they go to the vendors and say, oh, we want to have this in a format that I can share because it's required of me. So I think this will hopefully solve by itself because vendors will support these activities. Um, and that is common data formats. Now, different techniques is a bit more complicated because then you really have to, when you design these data formats, make sure that terms are really defined such that 
for example, ellipsometry can refer to the same numbers that, I don't know, XPS or yields or so refer to. And that is something where, yeah, one really has to invest. And I think one has to really get the community together. Um, I, I told already, we, we try to do this with what we can do within Fermat. But of course, a big aspect of what we try to do is also to reach out like to this event, uh, talk about it and get people to interact with us so that we can come to a common format or common standard or common definition of terms, not just uh, within our little community, but across the globe. Okay, are there other thoughts on this? Um, well, just a quick comment. Um, um, the, 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 so I, I really think that the idea of interoperability is very important uh, because we may never converge on one single format, right? Uh, because uh, everyone will come up with their own idea of how one uh, standard <laughs> common forward, uh, format must look like, right? And um, um, and it's happening all, uh, all the time. And so maybe interoperability for, for me, for me, in my personal opinion, uh, could be a, 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 prior, a priority in the near future, right? At the end of the day, you want to translate between different, uh, I don't know, microscopy formats the same way you, you know, go, you go from NumPy array to Torch tensor or something, you know, just <laughs> uh, one line of course or something like that. Yeah, so I'm just going to quickly bring up a point to the, you know, perhaps an example of interoperability is, you know, something Christoph mentioned too, like you have, we have DFT computations done from different types of, you know, electronic structure packages. So uh, how big a pain point is that right now? I mean, from your, anybody is free to speak, like, you know, is it, can we make it uniform easily now? Or is that still very painful to sit and, you know, put it together in the same format, like in the Nomad database, for example? You refer to Nomad. I'm, I'm not a total expert on Nomad. It seems Andrew has even known more about it than I do. Um, but as far as I know, uh, there was a huge investment to actually really reconcile. They call normalize these different code outputs so that it's not a pain, so that you can really upload the output of BAST, um, whatever you, you use, um, and you can actually see it in the database then on a level that can really be directly compared to other techniques. Yeah, That's I'll say. Really but yeah. other techniques, of course, yeah, there still is this problem. Yeah, I'll second that. A lot of that's taking place behind the scenes intentionally for the reasons that you mentioned, but it does seem that it works pretty well. And when there are things that crop up, I mean, it's nice that the team uh, does make adjustments. I will say maybe some slight pain point on the computational side is there's still a little bit of a gap between the molecular DFT folks and the solid state folks. And so there's uh, some things there that are a little bit trickier to get cross compatible, understandably. Um, but I think there's several initiatives too, like CC lib is a code for molecular uh, DFT packages to uh, create a more common interface between them. So I think there's still a lot of work being done in that space. Okay. Yeah. I think maybe we can move on to another question, Ben. Yes. So Rama asks, what is the role of, of government and uh, centers in, in deciding how we implement FAIR? And I'll extend that to uh, what services we're building and and such. Well, you know, the role of government is to enforce things, and uh, you know, if if well, um, if DOE provides funding, there is this, for example, data management part of you know every funding proposal, but it's not enforced, right? Uh, and so, I people just write it as a you know, the checkbox and. Uh, um, I don't see many people actually following what they wrote in the data, data management plan. So maybe being a bit stricter about enforcing data man management plan is one thing that you know the government can do. Regarding data management plan in Europe or at least in Germany, you now have to write at least one or two pages. So a small paragraph is not enough anymore. Yeah, it's pretty much the same in the US. Like two pages max yeah but i mean but but many of them are reasonable but i like sometimes i review proposals with that you know reasonable data management plan and then i don't see actually people doing anything that they described in that plan in the actual research so because there is no mechanism to enforce uh, it yeah i think that the enforcement mechanism is a is a fair point 
Uh, and I think yesterday we heard we heard a little bit about uh, you know what the the new memorandum from the Office of Science and Technology Policy will mean in that regard, less as far as the enforcement, but more in, in terms of you know the need for open open source data and uh, and such. So hopefully hopefully that will start getting a little bit more teeth, but also with resources to support doing that. Um, does anybody else have any ideas of where where government could help or centers that could be like a national lab, for example, setting standards? Well, that's what NIST kind of does, right? I don't but know, maybe I want to, wants to. Yeah, I want to, <laughs> I want to point out we don't want to make like strict rules, right? Also, um, yeah, we, we can give guidelines. That's all we can do right now. Uh, I guess we'll we'll move on from that question because it was kind of short, but I'll I'll take the next one, Arun, just to to keep things moving. Um, I think David asked a really important question, and John Allison added to that uh, around you know what are what are panelists and and others I guess here uh, doing towards sustainability. Uh, you know, the more data we put into the repositories and the more we depend on it, the more we need those repositories to be there for years to come. We know some of the funding mechanisms are shorter term. Um, he says, is that still just the problem of whomever stands up the repository or other tools? Any new insights on that front that doesn't take funding away from doing the science itself? Sustainability question for a lead balloon. Sorry. <laughs> um, I can uh, talk about this a little bit. So um, for MDF and Foundry ML, um, all data are open source and available on freely accessible systems that are supported by Argon ALCF storage um, and premium NSCA store or NS NCSA, sorry, <laughs> storage. Um, and they're published on distributed endpoints. So if our repository goes away, the underlying data can be easily moved to any other endpoint. Um, so that's sort of how that's how we're handling sustainability. I think there's also maybe an interesting point slash question here of like when let's say an academic research group has a, a database or a data set, right? Like it's pretty difficult to have pretty confident longevity in that particular research group's project, right? Um, but things like Zenodo and Figshare can be used not necessarily to display the data in an accessible way, but to just store it in a way that's probably longer term than what that particular group is doing. So I think that's a really beneficial initiative. At the same time, then you get data fragmentation where it can be really difficult for users to know where they should be looking for a given piece of data. Um, and so, that is a maybe a separate challenge too. And then also making sure that everything's in sync as you update your database, if it's updated, is an additional challenge too. But I think it's okay to rely on certain resources for certain tasks that they're better suited for than others. And I think that's a good example with the sustainability question where relying on uh, maybe other resources like just Nomad, Big Shares, and Odo might be beneficial. Yeah, I agree on this one that um, uploading on Figshare not only gives you the data, but version, but also gives you the DOI for this. And I, for example, I remember uh, we upload all our data in the Figshare, like uh, DFT data sets. And I know some of the researchers who took different snapshots of the data set and trained their individual machine learning and see how do they improve as you include more and more data. So they wanted to study if you if you are in, in if you are um, including more data, is it actually helping or not? You know, in that way, in terms of diversity of data. So this uh, sustainability has two advantages. If you have something like Fixture or MDF, uh, you can have this kind of study, which is possible, and also uh, reproducibility also uh, becomes more transparent in my opinion. So totally agree. Uh, maybe I can ask a question quickly uh, now. Uh, so, so one of the questions that I have been meaning to ask, maybe we can keep this short, but I'm very curious about the, the Jupyter Notebook publication strategy. And I would like to hear more, you know, from, from the others. Of course, Max talked about this, but, uh, you know, is there enough uh, enough of a motivation and enough of a, 
of a burning need you think i mean for, i personally can see you know the the huge advantage of you know just you know you publish a jupiter notebook that's your entire publication you know everything that needs to be there introduction motivation methods results are all part of it so you know would you individually you know want to incorporate that in your research would you support uh, an infrastructure which actually enables that or you know wh where do you sit on that you know i i'd like to hear from from, from people on that If I'm understanding this correctly, are you saying like a, a notebook that goes along with your paper that uh, has all of your code in it and explains like this is what I did to pre-process, this is my model? Yeah, well, well, well what, what, what we did basically, yeah, it's like the one way is just to have a Jupyter notebook separate from the paper, but our suggestion was how about it's, you know, augments paper and you just code cells are hidden by default. And so you read paper as, you know, as you would usually do and but then, hey, how about, you know, I want to try to reproduce this uh, figure, then you can actually uh, unroll that code, those code cells and run it. And then, you know, it will also make it easier to, to adopt it. But the, I mean, it's, um, it's not that difficult to do it now these days in, in, in Jupyter Notebook. Um, of course, you need to, that there are some plugins for references and so on. So writing, a paper, people write books in Jupyter Notebook. So writing a paper in Jupyter Notebook is not a big an issue. And adding code cells also is pretty straightforward. Um, I would, just quickly, I wanted to add that. So we did it in 2019, and you know it's 2023, and nothing really has changed in the uh, publishing landscape. So we've been, well, this is recorded, right? Anyway, I'll say it. Uh, we've been talking to many journal editors, and uh, they just don't seem to be too uh, excited uh, about it, right? And uh, I don't know what needs to be done to change it, but uh, maybe maybe you know reproducibility and transparency of science is not at the you know top of the list of their priorities maybe you know maybe something else i i will say that uh mateo uh cavalieri had a nice special issue in ijqc a couple of years ago where there were a couple of papers to try to demonstrate this kind of interactive paper where it wasn't necessarily a reproducible jupyter notebook but had uh, interactive figures, and you can download the data from the figures directly, which I think was a quite nice start. And obviously, it didn't really take off. But I think that example is one where maybe there's a middle ground between having this full Jupyter paper, which I think is great, but maybe not everyone wants to invest the time and in having some intermediate there to bring publishing into the future. But as you said, I don't know that the publishing folks maybe don't feel the same way. So yeah, that's a, a different question. You know, the way I, I, I thought about it is like, that you open a paper, I don't know, ACS Astana, and then there are different versions. Uh, uh, read open HTML, uh, save PDF. And I was, I was hoping maybe it was like open in Jupyter or something yeah. like that. And you click it and then you can run it. And it will spin an instance on, I don't know, AWS. But then, uh, you know, then ACS would have to pay to AWS to, <laughs> uh, for, for that, right? Uh, and they don't want because, well, like, let's not go there. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's an, it's kind of frustrating. But it, it, all the technology is there. You just need a will uh, mm -hmm. to, to do it. Awesome. Yeah, I think maybe we can start winding down the discussion. Maybe one or two quick questions. Uh, anything else you see, uh, Penn? There's a lot of nice discussion happening in the chat. Yeah, I'm well. trying to scan the chat now as well. Um... So there was a point made around libraries potentially being a source of su sustainability. I know libraries play that type of role within academia often. So it could be that we need to engage them more effectively. Uh, I think that's a really good comment. Uh, starting a new journal, that's great, Ali. <laughs> um, I agree. We could do that, uh, hopefully, with with the help of some of our, our journal friends. Um, I don't think I see anything else in the comments or questions that we haven't yet addressed. The question about data repository certification, if anybody can see that question and wants to. Oh, yeah. Say something on that. And that could include uh, some some journals like Science and Nature have, have standards. The DOE has pure resources, which Michael Cook mentioned yesterday. And then there was this core trust seal that was mentioned. Yeah, how do you, uh, you know, ensure that your data repository has been certified as being good by peers, being deemed trustworthy, etc. Uh, 
And any thoughts on that? You can have a likes and dislikes button. <laughs> yes, it, it would get spammed by bots. <sighs> Sorry, I was trying to find the question that you guys were referring to, and I uh, I didn't see in the chat. But is this just about uh, having like a quality? How do you have quality data? Um, so for for MDF, um, actually, and for Foundry ML, we uh, actually have a, a human in the loop that looks and assesses the data um, and make sure makes sure that it's of high quality and that everything is there that we need and everything makes sense. Um, so I think that's a, a great way to do it. Um, I think a lot of things get automated and things can get through the cracks and, you know, then everything gets spammed, but having an actual person <laughs> in the loop, which I think is so rare now, <laughs> um, does make a difference. This isn't really a seal of approval or anything like that, but I do like, uh, to some degree how the journal digital discovery has the data reviewer for uh, mm -hmm. certain papers. And so, you know, these are not necessarily large databases, but could be small papers as well. I think having then that dedicated reviewer to go through it and actually make sure that things are running at the very bare minimum or with the database that it's at least as accessible as people are saying um, is very valuable. So I, maybe there could be some way to, you know, kind of promote that, those kinds of reviewing efforts as well. I don't know, but I think that's a nice initiative. So in the computer science community, there's a lot of papers on openreview.net, right? I haven't seen a lot of them in the material science community. So something like open review for materials might be useful where people can actually look into it, not, not just the peer reviewers, but also some outside reviewers as well. Um, something like that might be useful. I think part of the question was also around like the standards themselves for core trust seal. So I think in materials data, we don't yet have uh, an exact bullet point list of like, here's what your repository should meet. And so maybe that's something that a working group within MARTA could address is like, these are the types of things we wanna see in a trustworthy repository. Um, and like, we know many of the things that we need and most of the most of the repositories have that, but having a checklist and having a name to that would be, would be really helpful, I think. Mm 